Welcome back to Computer Science 4303. Today, uh, we're talking about something pretty exciting, at least I think it's exciting, because it's the algorithms that you'll be using for assignment three. And we're gonna be talking about um, cellular automata and Perlin noise. And today is Tuesday. Just uh, make sure that you realize that assignment two is due on Thursday. So you've got a couple of days to finish that up if you're not already done. So let's hop over here into the slides for today and uh, we'll get started. Okie doke. So lecture number 11, cellular automata and Perlin noise, two really, really good tools for procedural content generation. So something we talked about a lot last time was randomness for PCG, right? And we said that one issue with using randomness is that pure randomness is, is just unappealing, right? You want to have some structure to the randomness that, you know, has some intuition to the user about what's going on. You just don't want pure noise. So what we really want to do is to generate content for gameplay that has some sort of human intuition or coherence behind it, because pure randomness is bad, but pure determinism means you have no variety, right? So we're going to use randomness for variety, but we're not going to use pure randomness. So one strategy that we can use, and we'll see that in this lecture, is we'll generate some random data as a starting point, and then we'll use some sort of method on top of that random data to shape it into something useful. And so our algorithm is going to be deterministic, but we can start that algorithm from a random starting point, okay? So that means that um, given the same data, we'll produce the same thing, but if we start with some, you know, random data, then we'll produce uh, more, um, more diversity in our eventual content. So for example, uh, here is some random noise, just a purely randomly generated 2D array of values colored blue or black. And what we're going to see by the end of this lecture is we're going to do one method called cellular automata, and we can shape this random noise into something that looks like this. And so you can see here that this has some sort of human intuition. Maybe it's like a, a cave system or a map for a roguelike, right? So we can use cellular automata to, to do this. And at the end, we'll show something called Perlin noise, which can take noisy data like this and turn it into something a little bit more interesting. And we can assign colors to it in interesting ways. And we can do things like terrain generation, for example. So we're gonna talk about cellular automata first, and then we're gonna talk about Perlin noise at the end of the lecture. So what are cellular automata? Have any of you heard of cellular automata before? Maybe you've taken uh, a course that uh, that showed them before. Well, cellular automata, they're a discrete model used for performing various types of computation. What do I mean by various types of computation? Well, it turns out that if you're a theory nerd, um, cellular automata are actually Turing complete. So you can write cellular automata that literally can compute anything that's computable. Now, you didn't... <laughs> You wouldn't necessarily want to do that outside of an academic setting because it would be incredibly slow to write, you know, windows in a cellular automata, but it could be done if you really want to. So CAs are defined by a series of rules or conditions which translate a regular grid of data into a new regular grid of data. So essentially what we're going to be doing uh, a cellular automata is going to take a binary array, so an array of ones and zeros. We're going to apply some rules to those ones and zeros based on where they appear in the array. And then the output of the CA will be a new array with new values, okay? So let's have a look at that. So 1D CAs, um, Stephen Wolfram wrote a book called A New Kind of Science in which he absolutely goes all in on CAs. And Wolfram called these 1D CAs elementary CAs. So given a 1D grid with cells marked ones or zeros, um, so zeros or ones, we can think of those as black or white or on or off or dead or alive, right? So binary, this binary on or off, these Boolean values, you know, we can associate 
whatever logic we want to those. So sometimes it just might be coloring for an image. It might be um, some Boolean state on or off. It might indicate some organism that's alive or dead, for example. So for each cell, you're going to look at that cell and its surrounding two neighbors. And I'm going to have an illustration of this, but I just want to describe it first. And based on the values of those three cells, we're going to turn on or off the next generation's cell, okay? So, in an elementary CA, we're going to start on the top row. So we're gonna start with just this row up here, okay? So this row at the top of this image, it's just a blank row with one black dot in the middle, okay? So here, we just have one array with a one in the very center and zeros everywhere else. Then we're going to apply a rule to that in order to generate the next row of data. Then we iteratively apply that rule to, gen to generate subsequent rows of data. So how is this working? Well, let me uh, move my camera down here and we'll go back. So here we have an example of these, these rules that we're talking about. So if we are looking only at the current cell, which is this one in the middle, and it's two neighbors, then that's three cells. So three cells have eight possible values, right? Because two to the power of three is eight. So what this, this up here says, if we see black, 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 then the next um, cell should be white. If we see uh, black, black, white, then it should be black. If we see black, white, black, then it should be white. If we see black, white, white, then it should be black, so on and so forth. So this up here is called a rule set, okay? So this rule set, we can apply to this first row. So we scan along the top row and we see, okay, well, there's a bunch of white, white, white. So the next row is going to be white. Um, if we see in the middle here, we see white, black, white. So that's white, black, white. Then the cell in the middle should be a zero. So I'll, I'm going to go over an example of this. I'll do one in detail. But just before we, we get there, if we order the rules in this way, from the most black to the most white, then we assign a number to these, a binary number one or zero, indicating whether it's white zero or black one, then this binary string forms a number, okay? Between one or between zero and 255. So this up here would be rule 01011010. And so Wolfram numbered all of these rules. And so this one up here is called rule 90. And rule 90 generates this image, which is a Sierpinski triangle, okay? So let's just have another closer look at how this is formed. So we're going to start up here with this array of data. This would be the top level of your, of your image, right? And then we apply some rule to that, okay? And we scan along, let me, let me restart this. We scan along in groups of three, matching it to the rule, and whatever the rule sets to put, says to put in the next generation, we fill that out down here. Okay? See how that works? So, what I want to do, I'm going to take a screenshot of this. And we'll do this by hand, because this is a little bit quick. So, let me um, exit out of this real quick, and we will hop over here to my blackboard. Okie doke. So I should be able to paste this. So here is our rule. It's a little bit big. So let me resize that. Okay. So here is the rule that we said we're going to implement. Now, let me just uh, create some random values here. So I'm just gonna go through and make some white and black cells. Okay. So let's say that this is the current array that I'm working with and I want to apply this rule to this row, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm first going to look at this cell right here and the surrounding two cells, 
okay? And whatever the rule says to do, I'm going to put right here in this cell. So let's just erase this and we'll do that. So here I have a uh, black, white, white. So I look up here and I see if it's black, white, white, then I should put a black beneath it. So let's take a black and we'll do that. Next is white, white, white. White, white, white becomes white. So we'll put a white there. Next is white, white, black. So white, white, black becomes black. So we'll do that. Then we have uh, white, black, black. That becomes black. Black, black, white becomes white. Oops. Uh, oops, why, why is that not changing? Oh, I see. Then we have uh, black, white, black. That becomes white. Now we have white, black, white, which is black. And I'm going to finish this whole row just so you get it. Black, white, white becomes black. White, white, black becomes black. White, black, white becomes black. Black, white, black becomes white. And now we've reached the end. So what we do here is we wrap around to the other side. Okay, so we've got white, black, black. And so white, black, black becomes black. So we put a black there. And then this one is black, black, white. So black, black, white becomes white. So that's how we would fill that out. And then we would go to the next row, the next row, the next row, the next row. And so that one, that 1D cellular automata becomes a 2D image, okay? And so this over here, this is iteration one, this is iteration two, this is iteration three, this is iteration four. So that's, that's how the cellular automata works. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. All right, so now you can see how this image was formed, right? Because we have this first row, we apply the rule to that row, then we get the second row, we apply this rule to that row, and it just happens to produce this pattern. Alrighty, and so this shell shows that. And the cool thing is, there are all sorts of interesting patterns that come from this, okay? So for example here, um, this rule 30 that we were just doing in on the blackboard is actually produces this, this pattern up here. Rule 54, excuse me, produces this one. Some rules only produce things on the left-hand side of the image. Some only produce on the right side of the image. And so all these rules, these are like the most interesting rules. Most of them either end up in being completely white or completely black, and they're not super interesting. But um, a lot, some of them are actually quite interesting. All right. So that's 1D cellular automata. What about 2D cellular automata? Well, they're similar to 1D, but they're on a 2D grid. And instead of just looking at the things to the left and the right, we're going to choose some neighborhood around the cell to apply the rule to. So based on a set of rules, that cell will either be alive or dead in the next grid. Okay? So possible rule cho choices we could make. Um, we could count the number of neighbors that are alive or dead. We could have specific neighbor conditions, like if the one on top is something but the one on the left isn't. We could have rules that are similar to the 1D automata, but essentially what we're doing is we're looking at the, the neighboring cells around us, coming up with some rule, and then applying that rule to generate the next generation. And so these are covered extensively along with 1D automata in, uh, by Stephen Wolfram in A New Kind of Science. And uh, in the notes here, you get this is uh, the book is available online for free on, on Stephen Wolfram's website. And so you can read it there if you're more interested. So, there's a bunch of interesting choices that you could make for the neighborhood of a 2D cellular automata, right? And these have names in the literature. Like, for example, if we look at uh, the cell itself and all its neighboring cells um, in eight directions, that's called a Mohr neighborhood. And if we look at just up, down, left, and right, that's called a von Neumann uh, neighborhood. So here, if we had a 2D grid, uh, we could do von Neumann neighbors, we could do more neighbors, or if we have a hex grid, we could actually take um, a hexagonal neighborhood as well. So um, these neighborhoods also have uh, a radius, and so if you ever see an algorithm talking about the von Neumann neighborhood of radius 2, then that's what this means. It means that we go up, down, left, and right from the current cell 
and then again from all of those cells. And so the more neighborhood would be a radius two in all eight directions, or we could have some arbitrary choice of, of neighborhood, but we're not gonna get that that far with it um, in this course. You could, you could do whatever you want to produce whatever you want. It has a lot of parameters that you can choose. So uh, many of you are probably thinking, I've seen this somewhere before. Where have I seen this before? Well, this is actually Conway's Game of Life. So this is by far the most famous cellular automata, and it was made back in the 70s. And it's a really fun introduction to programming assignment. Um, and it's called the Game of Life because specific configurations and specific rules can actually appear to be alive, which is really crazy. Um, I'll show you what I mean by this. So these cells in the cellular automata, they can appear to be reproducing. They can consume other cells and they can die off. And all of this can happen with just four simple rules. Okay, so here are the rules to Conway's game of life. Any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies. And we look at this, we're going to look at all of Conway's um, rules for the game of life with some sort of analogy for the real world. Okay, so this is what Conway wanted to do, is these rules have some sort of analogy into the real world, and then hopefully they, you know, produce some interesting results. So we're using um, a neighborhood, an eight-directional neighborhood of radius one, and we say that any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies as if by underpopulation. It means that if there's not enough neighbors around it, then it's just going to, like, it's not going to be able to survive. And so it has, it's underpopulation, so it dies. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation. So two or three is really the sweet spot where you just, you know, you continue on living. Any live cell with more than three live neighbors is going to die. So four or more live neighbors, it's overpopulated, you're too crammed, you got to fight to survive, so you're going to die in this case as if by over overpopulation. And any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell as if by reproduction, okay? So unlike most reproduction in the real world where, you know, you have two people that make a, make a baby, in this one, if you're, if you're not an alive cell and you have three live neighbors, you're going to become reactivated as if by reproduction. And there are lots of interesting patterns that come out of this. And I'm, I'm gonna show a video in the next slide, which is absolutely incredible. But these simple rules can come up with a number of different patterns. And people have given these patterns um, types and names. So, for example, there are still life patterns. So these still life patterns, if you put these into Conway's Game of Life, the rules will generate the exact same thing on the next generation. Okay, so these will never ever change. The rules will guarantee that if you see this, it will remain that way forever, unless it's acted on by some outside source. Then you're going to have things called oscillators. So oscillators, instead of staying the same, they oscillate between different patterns. So if you have this sort of uh, Tetris block here, the rules will change and up a, a three vertical Tetris block into a three horizontal Tetris block. And it just so happens that the same rules will change a three horizontal Tetris block into a three vertical Tetris block. And so that's going to oscillate back and forth between horizontal and vertical just with those rules. And you see here um, this sort of pulsar. It doesn't necessarily have to have a period of two. It could go um, between three things. Or this one here has a period of 15, meaning it goes through 15 different shapes before it starts repeating. However, they're still not the most interesting ones to me because these oscillate in place, they don't move. But there are other ones which oscillate and move. And these are called spaceships. And they're called spaceships because they sort of fly through this space and these rules just govern this. And you can see by this video that there are going to be a bunch of different patterns. Some actually consume other things 
some actually reproduce, you're going to see spaceships, and you can even set it up so that there's like, it almost looks like, like cellular reproduction in the body. Like it sets up so that just because these rules happen to be the way that they are, like there are factories that produce spaceships and those spaceships go on to like destroy other life. Absolutely nuts. So let's just have a look. Here's a small example of a couple of spaceships walking together, these walkers, right? Okay, that's pretty interesting. What about next? Well, this is a producer or a factory. This pattern goes back and forth, producing these walkers infinitely, unless something else happens to walk into it and mess up the pattern. So we have reproduction. Now we have reproduction. So two of these patterns, if you send them into each other, they sort of fight. They don't actually fight, but the pattern just means that they die. Now you can set these up to go, you know, basically infinitely far. Um, or you can wrap around. Or if you really get into it, you can have reproducers meeting in the middle to form reproducers. This is crazy. <laughs> I don't know if this like blows anyone else's mind, but... This is absolutely crazy that those four rules generate all this behavior. It's like an alien civilization sending resources to... Uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but like it's so interesting to me that this can happen, right? So this video on YouTube, it's called Epic Conway's Game of Life, and it keeps going with even crazier and crazier examples. So... Please go have a look at that. But that's Conway's game of life. Um, how does that relate to PCG, the thing that this lecture is supposed to be about, right? So you can think of Conway's game of life as procedural content generation, right? This algorithm is producing these patterns, it's producing these textures, it's even producing these motions and animations. So CAs have been used for decades for procedural content generation. And the 2D grid cell nature of a CA makes them a perfect fit for game representations, right? Because we talked about how grids are so often used in, in games. So there's no right or wrong to, like, way to use a CA for PCG. Just try things, go out, make your own rules, tweak the settings, etc. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at one way that we can use a CA to generate a cave-like 2D terrain for game maps, all right? So this is going to be what you're going to use in assignment three to generate um, levels for, for your PCG assignment. Okay, so CA for terrain generation. There are many, many different ways to do this, but we are going to discuss the one from this website because this website is really well done. You can refer to it. You can use the code from that website if you want to. I think it's in Java, but you can easily convert that to C++. And it has a live demo that we'll be looking at in a little bit. And this method can be used for the assignment, but you are not limited to this method for the assignment, okay? This method is going to use rules similar to Conway's Game of Life. So essentially what you're going to be doing for this assignment is implementing Conway's Game of Life. So just like the Game of Life, this method will decide on which cells live or die based on whether neighbors are alive or dead. That's it. That's the entire algorithm, okay? So if you know how to look up like things in a 2D grid, and you know how to manipulate data in a 2D grid, you, you're done. You know this algorithm already. So, uh, what we're going to do is let's go have a look at that website first before we talk about um, anything in more detail. So, here we go. We are now on that website. Here is the algorithm. So, there are four parameters in this algorithm. The first one is, uh, it's called birth limit. So here we go. Let's uh, let's look at birth limit. What does birth limit do again? There we go. So birth limit, as it goes up, you have fewer and fewer things that are alive in the simulation. Okay, so if we per put birth limit way down, then there are very few things that are being born. Just meaning that 
This is essentially the chance that something is alive when you generate the initial data, okay? Um, now, oh, sorry, that's not true at all. Why am I looking at that? Yeah, so this birth limit... Oh, I see. No, I got that wrong. Okay. Disregard what I just said. Um, initial chance. Initial chance. This is a... I, I was running the algorithm. Sorry about that. So from here is where you should start listening. So this algorithm, it has four parameters. The first one is not birth limit, but it's initial chance. So we're going to start the algorithm by generating random data. Okay, and this data has a random chance to either be a zero or a one, in this case, a blue or black. So that initial chance is governed by this initial chance variable right here. So if I turn this way down, then it means that 20% of the tiles, because it's 0.2, 20% of these are going to be black, versus if this was 0.8, then 80% of these are going to be black. Okay, if this is a one, then 100% of them are going to be black. Okay, so that's what that is. We start the algorithm by generating um, random data. Then the algorithm itself is just like Conway's game of life. So there's a birth limit, a death limit, and a number of steps. So I'm going to refresh this page real quick and go back to the slides. So... Here are what those variables mean. The chance to start alive, that's the initial chance, is the percentage chance to start alive in the initial RNG grid. So you're going to first generate a grid of random data and each cell has that percentage chance to actually be a one instead of a zero. The death limit is the lower limit when cells start dying. So like in Conway's Game of Life, you're going to count the neighbors and you're going to see um, how many neighbors are alive and cells will start dying based on that. Birth limit is where the cells start to become alive. So if you have a dead cell, you're going to count the number of alive cells and it will become alive based on that. And the number of steps is essentially the number of simulation steps that you perform in order to generate your final data. So over here, you can see a sort of animation. This plays really, really fast, I apologize, but it starts with random data. It has some parameters over here, um, and then it runs for some number of steps, probably five or six steps, okay? So I'm gonna show you the entire algorithm right here. So this is the 2D cellular automata for terrain generation. This is not valid C++, it's more like pseudocode, okay? So what is going to happen is you're going to be passed in a 2D grid. That is going to be the old or previous grid. And then what you're doing is you're creating a new grid and then returning that new grid from this function, okay? So the first thing we have to do is create a blank new temporary grid, which is the same size as the old grid. And by blank, I mean that it's all go it's going to be all zeros, okay? So this new grid is going to be the same size as the old grid, except it's going to be all zeros. Then, for each x, y location in the grid, we count the number of neighbors alive in old at that location, okay? So we store this in a variable called neighbors. So we're going to look in the old grid, around X and Y, count the number of neighbors alive. If the cell at X, Y is alive in the old grid, okay, so it's alive, now we're determining whether or not it should die or live. So if the number of neighbors is that's, that are alive is less than this death limit variable, then the new grid, X, Y, is going to be false. So if the number of neighbors alive is less than the dead limit, we die. Otherwise, we live on, okay? Otherwise, so that was the case if we were alive in the old grid. Now this else is if we were, um, if we were dead in the old grid. And if we were dead in the old grid and the number of neighbors alive is greater than the birth limit, then 
we set it to true, meaning that we become alive. We were dead, we become alive. Otherwise, if it's less than or equal to that birth limit, then it's false, so we stay dead. And then that's it. We just return the new grid. And as we vary the parameters, we can actually change the outcome of this terrain generation. So one of the benefits that this method has is the control over the different variables. So we can make the map appear more or less densely populated by varying values accordingly. So in the assignment, what I want you to do is to give each planet unique values for variety based on the planet's seed, okay? So here is the demo for that. We are on the website. We go back. All right, so here we have a birth limit of four. And that birth limit of four, if we go back, it means that if something is dead and the number of neighbors alive is greater than the birth limit, we're going to become alive. And the death limit is if the number of neighbors is less than the dead death limit, we become dead, okay? So here is, um, I'm gonna turn down the number of steps to zero. So I'm gonna generate a new world. So we generate a new world and the initial chance to be alive was 0.4 or 40%. Okay, I wanna make this as big as possible. Here we go. So we've done none of the steps yet, but let's do one step of, of that uh, cellular automata. So we do one step with a death limit of three and a birth limit of four. Boom. Okay, so wow. Uh, even just the first step, we see a bunch of like cool structure happening. However, it's still a bit, you know, grainy. Um, so let's let's keep going with the simulation steps. Here we go. We'll keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. As you see, at some point, it's going to reach some sort of equilibrium, right? Where it no longer happens or nothing nothing changes. So this algorithm it sort of makes these really cool structures and eliminates all the little random pepper things that were peppered in there, okay? So let's let's try a new one. In this one, let's see what happens when we have a lower initial chance. So that it's a more sparse environment. So let's do some simulation steps. And you can see that just by decreasing the initial chance by 0.1, so a 10% chance, we get a much sparser environment. Uh, let's try putting this up a bit to 0.7, that's a lot. Right? So after a certain time, after a certain amount, we don't really, uh, we don't want to put this up that high because we get these really weird, you know, super KV like structures. So we want to keep this around 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Now let's vary the death limit. So let's put the uh, birth limit up by one and the death limit down by one and see what happens. Okay. So of the death limit, let's, uh, let's put that down to one, see what happens. Okay, so this death limit now, because it's one, it's not high enough for us to actually be dying off, right? So all these single ones, they remain in the, in the map. If I put this up to two and do a few simulation steps, or even three, oh, I, I, might, I might have to restart this. Yeah, so you can vary these parameters, what I'm trying to say, to get these artifacts out, or, or however you want this to look. So please play around with those. Um, those parameters to produce the sort of cave-like results that you might want. Alrighty. So let's go back to the slides. So that's basically it. That's the algorithm that you have to implement for assignment three. Really easy. But that, that's half the assignment. We'll go into the rest of the assignment in the, in the next lecture. So we can vary these parameters to make these things look however we want. And there's also a really cool thing um, on this ear slap page. They have cellular automata for generating music. And I thought that was really cool. So you can go to this link if you want and, uh, and play around with that. Okie doke. So that's cellular automata. You can literally talk about CAs for an entire course. Um, but I don't want to go much more in depth with them because, you know, we're trying to teach a little bit of everything in this course and not go too deep into everything. Um, all right, so here is uh, the second half of the lecture, which is on Perlin noise. And Perlin noise 
is capable of generating some really, really amazing things, and it is used extensively in lots of areas, not only in game design, but in all sorts of areas of computer science. So, what does Perlin noise do at a high level? So, just as a disclaimer, um, I have not yet found a way to perfectly and deeply explain what is happening with Perlin noise to a way that I am satisfied with as an educator. So, I am going to give the high-level description of Perlin noise. I will show you what Perlin noise can do. I will give you some sample code and say go with it, okay? Um, because I find that if I go super deep down into the details of like the frequency space of Perlin noise and all that, it's just going to scare people off. When the implementation of Perlin noise, in my opinion, is far simpler than the mathematics of Perlin noise. And so I apologize. I know that's a bit of a cop out from an education standpoint. But what my goal here is for you all is to get you implementing Perlin noise as fast as possible. Okay, not necessarily to teach you like, you know, maybe the Fourier transform space that would get you to perfectly understand what Perlin noise is doing. So just keep that in mind that, you know, a slight apology from me meant that you're not going to completely understand everything that's happening, but you are going to be able to use it. Okay, and think of the analogy like I'm able to drive a car, but I don't know what a carburetor does, for example. Right? I don't need to know what every little part of the engine does in order to use it effectively. And the goal for me to, to get across to you in this course is to be able to effectively use this stuff, not necessarily understand all the mathematics behind it. Okay, so that, that's, my, that's my warning up front about my hand wavy explanation of Perlin noise. So what does Perlin noise do? Starting with random data, Perlin noise is able to smooth and cluster the data into intuitively interesting structures. So kind of like what we were doing with the CA, but in a much nicer way, in my opinion. The, off, the output of Perlin noise is often used in PCG as a height map to, do, to generate terrain or to generate textures. Perlin noise can be used to generate data in any number of dimensions. Okay, but we're going to be dealing with two dimensions for these assignments. Why is it called noise? So what do we mean when we say noise? Because noise usually means some sort of sound, right? So we think of noise, we think of loud sounds. Well, originally, if you can think back to CRTs or radio, if you know you're a dinosaur like me, um, radio and television frequencies could experience random values or interference which would produce a literal noise on the signal that the user could hear, often called static. So if you ever tuned into like a, a TV that had antenna that picked up signal over air, if you weren't picking up an actual signal from a station, what you would get would be noise, right? It's literal just shh. So that's what noise is. And so that's why, you know, that, that term carried over into this. It's called noise because it had no pattern, right? And so noise usually re means random values. So in these algorithms, when you read them online, noise is, is randomness, okay? But some people, capital N noise means noise that we have shaped into something that we want, okay? So a 1D noise example, this is random values. So let's say we take an XY um, Cartesian grid and for each X value, we plot a random Y value, and then we connect them together via lines. Here's what we get if we have random values for that, okay? But here's what we get if we use Perlin noise, okay? It's randomized, but you can see how this would be much more useful to us than this would, okay? For a lot of different reasons. So Perlin noise, its output, can be used, we could have a 2D array of values, all right? So this could be used for a texture, it could be used for an animation, it could be used for a bunch of different things, it could be used as a height map 
for a 3D surface. So for example, let's say this is producing values between zero and one. That's typically what you're going to have as an output for Perlin noise is values between zero, which would be black, and one, which would be white. So if you translate a one into some maximum height and a zero into some minimum height, then you can create a 3D surface from that, okay? So something like this in two dimensions, if you map the colors to heights in a mesh, you can actually create 3D surfaces. So this terrain generation algorithm that's generating this is done with Perlin noise, okay? And that's how it, how it works. You can also use Perlin noise, as we saw before in this example, if we assign some interesting colors to the output of that Perlin noise between zero and one, we can get something like this. And it turns out that Perlin noise is often used for things like faking water refractions or water textures, things like this. Excuse me. And again, as we vary the parameters, we can get different levels of detail or smoothness, or blockiness, or choppiness. So just like the CA, um, oh, someone said the video got affected. Yeah, that, that probably my bit rate goes, goes all haywire, but it's, it's not real time, that's just a video. So just like the cellular automata that we saw, um, it had that like death limit and birth limit and initial chance, all of those things. Um, there's going to be parameters that you can vary in Perlin noise as well to be able to shape the data, um, the data output, however you want. So the Perlin noise output, typically Perlin noise is going to give us a grid of values between zero and one. So these are often interpreted as grayscale values, right? So if you want to plot that on your screen, you can just say, okay, I'm going to create a color. If your color space is between 0 and 255 and your output is between 0 and 1, you just multiply that by 255 and set it to R, G, and B, and now you've got a grayscale color space, okay? So that's how you might uh, create a texture, a grayscale texture with Perlin noise. Or we could also interpret those values as a height map, like we just saw, and then color them in interesting ways to produce realistic terrain. Okay, so Perlin noise coloring. If we take our output values between 0 and 1, well, the most natural and intuitive way to uh, interpret those numbers is just a grayscale value, right? However, we could apply any sort of gradient that we want to. And so we could have discrete colors, for example, right? So maybe a 0 would be a green, uh, a 0.5 would be a yellow, and a brown would be um, uh, a 1, or we could have a complete gradient from yellow to red and create some sort of fire effect or fire clouds or explosion or whatever, okay? So you can take this Perlin noise and trans like transform it into whatever you want. So here's where we get to my, back to my hand wavy part. Rather than me create a whole bunch of slides just stolen from other websites, okay? I'm just gonna send you to the website itself. So here's the website that I think that you should use to implement Perlin noise on your assignment. So just to give you an example, um, just to let you know, uh, Perlin noise is not required for the assignment, but I highly recommend you implement it. Um, you get bonus marks for using Perlin noise in the assignment. And I think it'll be some people from last year's class said that playing around with Perlin noise was one of their favorite things they've done in all of computer science. Okay, so uh, let's go to this website and this website here is excellent. However, um, it was written in 2009. So just in case that website ever goes down, I made a PDF of that website, which is hosted on my website. So you can just load the PDF if you want to. It's like all the, all the, the clutter is, is, is removed. So for example, here, here is the website. Um, this is how to use Perlin noise in your games. And if you click on the PDF link, you need the, oh crap, hang on. There we go. So the PDF is just that website, but I've created a PDF of it. Okay, just, just for educational purposes only, I'm not trying to, please go to the website as long as it exists, but in case it doesn't exist at some point, there's the backup of it. So 
Um, the Perlin noise code is here. It's literally here. Um, it's written in what I believe to be Java, but this is very easy to convert into C++. Okay, so here's the code. Um, it goes through the steps. Let's talk about those steps real quick. So that's the code. And also uh, there's another reference here, which goes into more of the details about value noise. So Perlin noise also called value noise. Um, some of the mathematics behind that and how it, um, how it, how it works in a more mathematical sense, but I'm not going to get too deep into it. Here's what happens at a high level in Perlin noise. Okay. You're going to generate some random, uh, like a 2D array of random noise. Then you're going to generate smooth noise arrays by sampling from the initial array at various frequencies. And those are going to be called octaves. Then you're going to blend those arrays together to find to, to form the final Perlin noise image. So what does that look like in practice? Well, in one dimension, it looks like this. We're going to have some random data. We're going to sample from it. And we have another variable, which is called scale. It's explained on the website. We sample from that. Then we sample from this one. Then we sample from this one, we sample from this one, from this one, and then we blend all of those together in order to find uh, the final Perlin noise. Up here in two, dimensional, in two dimensions, this is what it can look like. We have our initial random data, okay? Then we're going to sample from that. And the way we sample from it, if I can use a pen, is essentially we're going to choose some frequency. Okay, so let's say our initial data is here. I hope you can see these sort of dots. Uh, I'm going to draw like sticks up. So we're going to sample at like a regular interval on this grid. This is another, it's a hand wavy explanation, right? So here's where we're sampling from this like regular grid, which is smaller. So let's say we're sampling from every second point, for example. So we sample from every second point and we form a new, less resolution version of that. But it has to be the same size. So what we do is when we sample every second one, we may fill in the, the gaps by taking the average of the ones around it. Then we sample from this one, or sometimes they sample from the original one. So sample from the original one, and now maybe we're taking every fourth value. So now we have three values to fill in, and so we may just linearly interpolate between those, okay? So again, I don't want to go too far into the math about exactly how it works because the code is there for you. But essentially, we keep sampling at higher and higher and higher frequency or lower and lower frequencies so that we get blurrier and blurrier and blurrier images. And then we combine those things together and we form our final Perlin image, okay? So we have our initial data. Um, here, that gets sampled and sampled and sampled and sampled and sampled, and those get combined together to form the final Perlin noise. So the parameters that you have in your Perlin noise algorithm are the frequency at which you sample, meaning how blurry does it get, and um, this thing they call a bias or a scale which is how you actually blend those things together, okay? So those are the parameters that you use in the algorithm. And again, that can be used as the output. The output of this can be used for a height map, can be used for texture generation. It can be used, this is really cool, it's used for blending. So if you want to blend some grass and some dirt together in a realistic way, you can generate Perlin noise and then what you can do is say, well, wherever I have a one in the Perlin noise, I sample from the grass or wherever I have a zero, I sample from the dirt and you get this nicely blended image together. You can do height maps and you can render those meshes and you can get all sorts of interesting things. So that is a very, very high level explanation of what Perlin noise does. And the code is there on that website and I am giving you full permission to use that code as the basis for you implementing Perlin noise on the assignment. Now, let me show you why you might want to use Perlin noise on the assignment, because it's really cool. All right. So what I did 
was I did up an example of Perlin noise in C++ and I almost literally copy and pasted that code into, into C++ and just changed the little bit of syntax that turns Java into C++. So let's run it and see what we have. Okay, so in assignment three, you will see a very similar interface to this, okay, where I can uh, zoom in and drag around the terrain on a planet. However, what this does is it's just doing Perlin noise. It's not doing the rest of the assignment. So let's zoom in here and we can see that what I've done is essentially generated a 512 by 512 random grayscale image, okay? So every pixel in this image has gotten a random grayscale value, okay? Between zero and 255, or between zero and one, depending on how you're looking at it. So I have some buttons here on the keyboard. And what the buttons on the keyboard will do is this various level of scaling, or sorry, frequency sampling. So it's the octave number, okay? So as I put the octave number up, that's more and more and more blurring of this of these uh, these values. So um, if I hit the W key here, you'll see it gets a little bit blurrier. I hit the W key again, gets a little bit blurrier and a little bit blurrier and a little bit blurrier, right? So that, that blurring, this intelligent blurring, so the different frequency samplings and the combining of those together, that produces blurrier and blurrier and blurrier images, okay? Now you may want it to be this blurry, you may want it to be this blurry, okay? And you may say, okay, well, I don't want it to look exactly like that. Can I, well, let's just use a new random seed. So I have a button to just hit a new random seed. So I get a bunch of these uh, Perlin examples, okay? So you can see how it goes from completely random data and it combines that random data together using various levels of this sampling and recombination to form the final Perlin noise. The other uh, parameter was this scale value or bias, some people call it. And what that does is it's almost like a level of detail. So this isn't, no, so if I go down too far, it becomes too like, I don't know, N64 like texture. If I go too far up, it becomes almost random again, okay? So as I vary this scale algorithm or this, this scale or bias, this is the other parameter that I can vary. All right, so you can see how this works. All right, now let's say I wanted to take this and turn it into something interesting. Um, like for example, let's, let's see how we could color this. All right, so how could we color this? Let's go back to the blackboard to see how I could color this. All right, so let's get rid of what I did before. Oh no, I'm gonna have to, uh, One second. Do, 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 do. All right. So ignore this stuff on the top. I can't remove that because I went back uh, too far with the uh, with the undos. All right. So here's how we're gonna color our our uh, our thing here. So we're gonna have. Oh geez. Hang on a sec. Black. Okay. So. I'm going to have a 2D grid, but let's just pretend that I have like a 1D grid for now, okay? So along the bottom here are some values. So my Perlin noise is going to output some stuff like this, okay? So for each value in my array, it's going to output, you know, noise that goes up and down, right? So this noise that goes up and down... Let's say, for example, I wanted to generate something that looked like actual world terrain. Well, what could I do? I'm going to show you an example of what I did. So let's choose some line. Uh, let's say, I don't know, I'm going to choose it right here. So if this here is a zero, so if my value is a zero or my value is a one, maybe this is like 0 0.3. So what's going to happen is anything beneath... 0.3, I'm going to color blue. Okay, so let me do that. Anything beneath 0.3, I'm gonna color blue. I've gotta finish this line over here or it's gonna come back to haunt me. So I'm gonna, anything under 0.3 is gonna be blue. 
anything above 0.3 is going to be green. Okay, now I know this is already green and I've kind of got these grids in here. But essentially what I'm saying is I'm mimicking the way that sort of the earth works, right? How a video game level might work. Where it's any value under a certain amount is going to be blue, indicating it's water in that like little dip. Anything above that value is going to be green, indicating maybe it's a hill, okay? And maybe what I do is values that are like um, really close to 0.3 are going to be a lighter green, and then we're going to have a darker green up here. Values that are close to 0 0.3 are going to have a lighter blue, and then maybe we have a, a darker blue, and then a darker blue down here. Okay, so that's the way that I'm going to scale my colors. So if we go back to my code, I'm going to press a button, and this will magically happen. But what I want to do first is rerun this. Okay, so I'm going to hit this button, and that's what I've done, right? is I've colored all of this so that if the value is initially below a certain level, so all the dark cells will become blue and all the light cells will become green. So look at this light cell right here, that becomes green. This dark cell is going to become blue. But this, <laughs> this kind of is bad, but let's apply the Perlin noise now to it. So watch this. Oh, wow. Now it's starting to look like something really interesting. Just a few iterations of Perlin noise with this coloring scheme. And look what we have. We have like an actual video game world that I could use. And I could vary, you know, maybe, I, maybe this would be a swamp. Or this could be like a Final Fantasy map. Or this would be like a map of the Earth now, right? And what I did was I built something into the controls here where I can press a button to raise or lower that water level. So if I raise the water level, we get more land. And if I lower the water level, we get more sea and more islands. And I can just sit here changing the random seed to generate new stuff all day, right? Now that bias that we talked about, that sort of level of detail parameter, I can hit that as well. So if I want to go like really N64, I can. Or I can get super detailed to the point where maybe I don't want that much detail, right? And I can take that and still vary like the number of octaves. I can vary all sorts of stuff to get all this. So just imagine like you can do this for your assignment, right? And it's really cool. Uh, you could put like treasures in here. You can just think of like sticking a character here and letting them walk around, right? If you could say, okay, this is the world I want to go to. If you had a 3D game, now you turn this into a 3D height map and you can just be walking around in this video game world. And it's literally, I'll show you like how much code it is. The entire, the entire Perlin thing, like really nicely done is like 150 lines of code. But it's not even that. That's like all my classes and stuff around it. It's literally just the code from this website. So here is how you generate the initial white noise. Here is how you generate the smooth noise based on a previous noise and an octave level. So the octave level is the level of blurring. And then um, here's how you generate Perlin noise with an octave count. So this is basically the whole algorithm right here that generates that really cool stuff that I was just showing. So I hope this shows you sort of the value of Perlin noise. And let me just do uh, one more real quick. So I'll turn on this, bump it up, and then like move the water level down a bit so we get an interesting world. Like look at that, a new world, a new game world, a new map for civilization or whatever, right? Super easy to do, super quick. I know that I hand waved over a bunch of the, the mathematics of it, but I think the mathematics of it are just going to be, they're going to intimidate you more than they are going to inform you at this point. But they are on that website if you want to go over them. So that's all that I had for today. I hope you enjoyed it and I think uh, assignment three will be really fun and uh, I'll be giving out assignment three on Thursday which is the next lecture when assignment two is due. So thank you very much for tuning in and uh, I'll see you in the next one.